All right, welcome to Culture Couch Live. We've got Carly, Miss O, Murph. How are we all? Very good. Hi, How are you? Guys? Carly. Excellent, guys. Well, this is a bit of a topical question, so we might get straight into it. It's from Brett. So what he does, and I'll paraphrase a bit, talks about he's been watching a lot of the Olympics, obviously a lot of footy because he's in lockdown. His question is around what's the number one takeaway you would give businesses in relation to, to sport? And it's, yeah, I mean, it's topical. We've seen... Yeah, a lot of Olympic good stuff. I mean, the great thing about the Olympics is some really good stories, there's some really sad stories. There's people that, are, that get injured, you know, and it's every every four years, or in this case, it's every five years. So, um, Miss, I might start with you because you've been involved in a lot of different sports and obviously now in the corporate world. So in answering Brett's question, well, what, what's the biggest thing that you would suggest to the corporate world to take away from, from the sport? Yeah, Rosie, I'll probably just um, put a lens on the swimming team. Um, and I think with every, everything at the Olympics, it's like we say in our process is that it's all about performance. So, you know, the Olympics is about performing on the day under pressure. But the swimming team, it's interesting, there was an article today in, in The Age in, in Melbourne talking about how they've handed a lot of ownership over, over to the swimmers to create yeah. the environment that they want to help them perform at their best. Um, so, you know, they've obviously performed unbelievably well, but there have been some um, frameworks that have been put in place around their culture and around the ownership that swimmers take um, of their environment that have helped them to perform really well. And to me, that really rings true with, you know, with what we do with, with our clients and trying to establish that environment and providing people with ownership to make their environment a, a high-performing one. Well, I think on that, Miss Owen, and Murph, I'll, I'll throw it to you. When you talk to individual athletes and they go to somewhere like an Olympic Games, most of them talk about team, don't they? Like it's a lot because they don't actually get that team environment. And it's a really good message, Murph, because we, we stop a lot of sessions, don't we, and really break down that sort of notion of team because it is easy to get in silos. And I guess if you are a swimming team, individual medal um you know and in the athletic team we saw a great effort it was a peter bowl great effort in the 800 meters but it is easy to stay siloed even in businesses Murph, isn't it yeah i think the thing that stands out for me uh rizzy was is fun and so being a part of a group of people yeah. enjoying enjoying being around with people i i think uh when when we reflect on our corporate work too often people go to work and they forget that they're spending more time at work than they are at home. Mm. And so you've got to enjoy what you do and, and not get caught up in the jargon and all that stuff. So you look at these young athletes, whether it's the Olympics or, the, or normal sports, but the joy <laughs> that they, yeah. they have for each other, for what they're achieving, for helping each other get better. Mm. It, it, we forget that that's what our life should be. And I, I think... Um, if we take nothing else out of the Olympics, it, it's not even about winning. It, it, some of the people that you see either finish or finish second or third, they're just as happy as if they won the gold medal. And I, I, I've just really enjoyed um, the preparation, the, as Dave says, the performance under pressure, but most of all, the celebration and the, yeah. and the jubilation of not only winning themselves, but winning together. And it that, that's the team piece, like winning together. And that, that was a great example in the swimming yesterday when Kate Campbell came second, but the first thing she said to her teammate was, I'm so proud of you, that was an amazing race. And that's the vibe of the team, right? Like, yes, it's individual, but her first instinct was just to be so, so happy for her, you know, colleague who, yeah. who got that gold medal. And it was just so nice to see that camaraderie and that really massive sense of team. Yeah. Well, why, Carly, then, do you think, because you, you're right, it's a great point. And, and having been in a team sport since I was 17, it, it's really obvious to me. It, it's obvious how strong we can become together and how much we enjoy things when we're together, the connection that we have when we're together. Like, it's really obvious for me. Why is it not as obvious in the corporate world? Because we, we do see a lack of connection, a lack of team, mm. and a lot of silos. And you, you've been in some big companies where that's been really prevalent, haven't you? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it comes back to what Miso said before around that sense of belonging. Um, and it's always just, you know, leaders get into those roles because they're really competent at what they do, but not they haven't always had that leadership training. And now that we've spent time in all of that leadership um, research and podcasts and articles, we know how important that sense of belonging is in establishing that sense of belonging with the team because fundamentally that's what everyone's yearning for. So if leaders are able to establish that sense of belonging and that collaboration with the team, that's when they start to get that really high performance. But I think a lot of leaders aren't aware how important that sense of belonging is or, or probably also how to achieve that sense of belonging. Do you reckon Carly people get caught? I, I, I sit in workshops and on Zoom calls. And I, I just wonder why do you keep doing what you're doing if you don't enjoy it? So do people get caught having to pay the mortgage or having to send? Or, but, but why do we tolerate substandard environments and cultures? And why do we perpetuate them even as leaders? How, how does that happen? Yeah, I think I think it takes a lot of courage to admit that you're not enjoying the role, the culture's not right for you and that you need to look for something new. I think that actual moment when you make that realisation um, from subconscious to conscious is actually quite a hard thing to do and you need some really good, you know, mentors around you or just people to bounce things off to get to that point. And then obviously you need a job to go to, right? So then it's about what do I actually want to do? What is going to fulfil me? What's my perfect role? And then being able to actually find that and work but, out what but, that is. As a leader, though, you don't have to leave a job. You can make sure you can make some changes yourself. Like, Rizzy, you've been a leader in an organisation. If you just keep doing the same thing over and over and over again, we, nothing changes. And, in fact, what you're doing is making it exactly the same for the people underneath. What, why, as leaders, don't we stop and go, hey, there's something not right here? Why, why can't we change it? I think, Murph, and we talk about it all the time, if we, want to, if we relate it to Brett's question around sport, because sport has such a lens on it, doesn't it? Like, like sport demands change. Because if you don't change and you keep doing the same stuff over and over and again, you're going to get sacked. And the whole world knows whether you won Olympic gold, silver or bronze. The whole world knows you know, now whether the boomers, you know, in, in the Australian boomers or the opals, if you, want, if you want to take the basketball, the whole world's going to know whether they're successful or not successful. I think one of the biggest things, Murph, why corporates don't change is because we think people don't know, but they do. But because it's not as public, mm. we sort of just tend to let it roll along and then a month rolls into six months, rolls into 12 months, rolls into two years. And before we look around, we're still doing the same thing we've done. And, and I think that's a really big part of why sport does it so quickly. To your point, Miss, about the Australian swimming team, you know, I think was it the last, what, what they, uh, how many gold in the last limits? Was it one? Was it? Yeah, two, two or three, I think. Two or three, are, but so everyone knows what happened. So then, yeah, then you've got to make the choice, don't don't you? And I think probably my main message to Brett would be: don't sit back, Murph. Don't don't just sit back and accept it, because there is a better way. There's a more successful way. If you don't have connection at work, do something about it. If you don't have leaders that can empower people, don't do something about it. If you don't understand your role, seek role clarity. Sorry, Miss. So what? I wasn't really clear on, you know, what you needed me to do. We talk about ask questions and listen. I mean, you know, all the stuff we do clearly relates to it. But, but I think it's the immediacy, Murph, isn't it, of the change that happens? Because in corporate, if you're the only one pushing and you can't get anyone else behind you, then it feels like it's too hard. So you just do your own thing. And I think that's that complacency is probably the issue that you're talking about, Murph. I think the other thing, Rizzi, and you would know this, that in sport, even if you are the leader and things aren't going well, someone's going to tap you on the shoulder and say, oh, I reckon we need to have a look at things. I reckon we yeah. need to change things. Yeah. And I'd, I'd, I'd venture to think that in corporate, sometimes that doesn't happen, that either someone's not you know, having the courage to tell the leader that things aren't working or the leader themselves don't have the humility to understand and recognise that their environment and their culture needs to change. Yeah, it's the conversations, isn't it? The conversations happen 
at a footy club. I mean, it's still whether the leader agrees with the conversation, yeah. but the conversation does happen. Whereas in the corporate world, the the notion of real talk is is really challenging, isn't it? You know, it's it's really challenging. I, I suppose to your point, Carly, because there's a bit of it is, you know, oh, I'm not sure who else thinks this way, and you know, mm-hmm. does does Jim think this way? Does Mary think this way? I don't want to be seen as backstabbing. So there's, I guess, there's reasons behind it. I think but the in, focus is on getting stuff done. So yeah. let's just get stuff done, and there's not as much actual review and reflection on the environment yeah. or the culture. Yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. I guess, I guess the other thing is we're focusing here on negative environments as well. We've <clears throat> a lot of co- a lot of companies have great environments, so it's not uh, it's not all like that. I think probably the other thing I was interested in, and I'm interested in from your end, Miss, I was um, given the COVID situation in Sydney and the lockdowns and, and um, Queensland as well at the moment, and we've all been through it down here. Um, how do you how do you keep um, athletes engaged when they're long term injured, when they when they can't because it, it's I know it's a massive a massive thing and I know clubs do it and there's probably things we can learn from a uh, corporate perspective with people in lockdown. Um, similar. Yeah, no, and, and Carly hit that concept on the head, which is the feeling of belonging, you know. I think the biggest complaint that long-term injured athletes would would have uh, is they lose that sense of connection to the rest of the team. Um, they don't feel sort of wanted or needed or you know valued. Um, good teams will ensure that that still happens with injured athletes, and it's a massive difference. And I think it's a great message for our corporate clients, especially with their teams in lockdown, say in Sydney and Queensland, is keep people connected, keep that sense of belonging there, keep making them feel that they're part of something bigger than just themselves. So yeah, Matt, what are some ways we can do that then in terms of keeping people connected in, from a corporate point of view? Yeah, I guess we learned a lot in Melbourne last year, didn't we, didn't we when we were locked down for so long? Um, uh, I think one that you're big on, Carly, is walking meetings, um, getting out with someone when you can, putting in place structures I think is really important, buddy systems where people don't uh, get missed or don't fall fall through the cracks, you know, providing care packs or gifts to the team, having having drinks on a, on a Friday afternoon on Zoom, like getting everybody together. You know, there's a, there's a million different ways, but you've got to, you've got to stop and think through. I don't know if I, have you got any others off the top of your head? Oh, really? just interesting also at um, at the primary school, they do a wellbeing check-in every morning. So before yeah. any classes start in the morning, you just have to say how you're feeling for the day, like angry, happy, sad, whatever it might be, and just a really quick check-in so that they get a bit of a pulse about how everyone's feeling. And I'm not sure if any corporates do that. Perhaps they do. But for people who are struggling, it's I think acknowledging it is really important. So having someone who can check in and say, look, I know things are tough, yeah. you know, do you want to chat about it? Is there anything I can do to help you? And that acknowledgement and just understanding of what everyone's going through on an individual level, I think, is really important. Yeah, I think the big thing for me, Murph, is when, when we're talking to people, like, they tend to go straight into business on Zoom, don't they? It's not that small talk. Yeah. And I reckon you've got to find time for the small talk, Yeah, whether it's the start of the meeting, it's a WhatsApp group, it's a bit of a, yeah, guys, let's send out the best joke for the week or something. So that's what we're missing. We're, we're missing the water cooler talk when you walk from the from the lift to your office and you've spoken, you know, Carly, how's Ben going? How are the kids on the weekend? Oh, that was great. You say, um, you know, fantastic. Um, geez, great win by the, the demons on the weekend. Murph, geez, north of going. So you've had, you've had four or five, sometimes, sometimes 20 conversations, whereas now... I think it's just not getting straight into business. I, I think that's probably the one thing that I would I would say on the Zoom calls because mm-hmm. often they're back to back to back to back and then you're going to be exhausted by the end of the day sort of thing. I think so. you need to take pressure off people too, Rosie, because when you're at home and you're homeschooling and you're locked down, you have to work more to get everything done. So you're not just doing your eight hours, you're doing some in the morning before the kids get up and some at the end of the day just to catch up. So yeah. the small talk for some people is going to be hard because they don't feel like they've got enough time. So yeah. taking the pressure off and letting them understand that, yeah. you know, it's not a normal circumstance and it's okay to, you know, take five seconds just to check in on people, I think. I think yeah, thank, yeah definitely. Um, I think, Murph, just picking up your point, look, the corporate world, 
does a lot of things really well. It's probably just the simple things. Just, just don't underestimate the simple things, you know, the notion of team empowerment and take, you know, I think you can take a lot out watching the Olympics or watching the footy or whatever you've been watching, you know, when you're locked down. I often say to people, even if you don't follow sport, I, what I love about sport, it, it is a good helicopter view of business, isn't it? Because you're seeing all the moving parts, you're seeing the pressure that comes, you know, Jess Fox's his effort to just control what you can control, you know, put all this stuff. So they're the concepts we talk about. And you're right, Murph, businesses do it really well. A lot of the good businesses, it's just sharpening them up and just continually to, to, to change things. Don't keep doing the same thing over and over again if, if things aren't working. I think also, Rosie, like keep listening to your people, keep talking yeah. to your people, even if sometimes you hear stuff that you don't want to hear because yeah. – yeah, that's that's going to keep you in touch with with your team and your and your environment, and ultimately that's going to help your culture. Yeah, I mean that's been a big focus for us, hasn't it? Listening and asking questions, leaders. Yeah, massive, massive. All right, guys, um, we better get back to the Olympics. What's on today? So, um, <laughs> I don't know. Is there is rock there a, climbing today? Are they rock doing um, are they doing the fight? They're doing the finals at night now. The seems to have changed. Yeah, well, 100, 100 was good. What was the Italian fella last night? And then the high yeah. jump, they, they split the gold medal. Can you, that's another whole culture couch. So for those of you who didn't see it, they agreed to split the medal. Otherwise, there was going to be a jump off. Who would have agreed to a jump off, Nissa? Like, who's going to well, give away a gold medal? I know, exactly right. And my other thing is with the long jump, and David Colbert, the Channel 7 commentator, has been banging on about it, but... Why are they jumping in a pit of dirt rather than a pit yeah. of sand? It's mud. I don't, I don't understand it. <laughs> what about the BMX guy? How good was the Aussie matter. BMX guy? Yeah, BMX. A lot of, yeah, lot he of was great. great. Yeah, a lot of great stories great. in there. Mate, he's yeah, been in the gym a bit too. He's got some good arms on him. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> hey, he's great. All right, guys. Well done. Thanks very much, everyone, on the Culture Couch. We'll yep. see you next time. See you guys. Bye. Bye-bye.